Hello, welcome to our presentation on osteoporosis and the older adult, screening and intervention by Brittany Gallagher and Megan Skipper. Our objectives for this presentation are students will be able to define osteoporosis and understand risk factors that can lead to development of osteoporosis. Students will learn risk assessment and screening tests for osteoporosis. Students will learn how to read and understand bone density results. Students will learn conditions and medications associated with potential bone loss. And students will be able to discuss ways to prevent bone loss and learn interventions physical therapists can provide to prevent or improve osteoporosis. So what is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis is a bone disease that occurs when the body loses too much bone makes too little bone or both. When viewed under a microscope, healthy bone looks like a honeycomb. When osteoporosis occurs, the holes and spaces in the honeycomb are much larger than in healthy bone. Osteoporotic bones have lost density or mass and contain abnormal tissue structure. Many people have no symptoms until they have a bone fracture. 54 million Americans either currently have osteoporosis or have low bone mass that puts them at risk of developing osteoporosis in the future. One in two women and one in four men over the age of 50 will break a bone due to osteoporosis. Osteoporosis affects men and women of all races, but white and Asian women, especially women who are postmenopausal, are at the highest risk. 19 billion dollars with a B is estimated per year in cost due to fracture recovery. By 2025, experts predict osteoporosis will be responsible for 3 million fractures and an estimated 25 billion dollar annual cost. Some of the most common fracture locations are the hip, the spine, and the wrist. Other complications include back pain, which is a very common presenting first symptom if it's not a fracture, loss of height, stooped or hunched posture, which we've learned is called dowager's hump, feelings of depression or isolation due to fear and limited mobility, and relocation to a long-term care facility. 20% of seniors who break a hip die within one year from complications of either the broken bone itself or the surgery to repair it. Being either over or underweight can affect an older adult's risk of fracture and bone loss. Overweight individuals especially see an increase in risk in arm fractures. So now let's talk about risk assessment. Relative risk likely depends on how much bone mass you are able to attain at a younger age. During your 20s, the bone renewal process slows and peak bone mass is usually reached by 30 years of age. Some non-modifiable risk factors are sex, age, race, family history, body frame size, and comorbid conditions. And smaller body frames might have less bone mass to draw from as they age. And then some modifiable risk factors include sedentary lifestyle, tobacco use, and excessive alcohol or caffeine consumption, more than two drinks per day on a regular basis. So here's a list of conditions that have all been found to be associated with potential bone loss. They include autoimmune disorders such as RA, lupus, MS, and ankylosing spondylitis, breast and prostate cancers, endocrine conditions such as diabetes mellitus, hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, Cushing's, premature menopause, and low levels of testosterone or estrogen, gastrointestinal conditions such as celiac and inflammatory bowel disease, hematologic conditions such as leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, and sickle cell disease, mental illnesses such as eating disorders and depression, neurological conditions such as stroke, Parkinson's, and spinal cord injuries, and others include AIDS and or HIV, COPD, the female athlete triad, chronic liver or kidney disease, organ transplants, polio and or post-polio, malnutrition, scoliosis, and weight loss. 
This slide displays several screening tools that calculate a risk score of fracture and or osteoporosis for individuals. The list includes the age bolt one or never estrogens tool, the body weight criterion, the fracture risk assessment tool, the Garvin fracture risk calculator, osteoporosis risk assessment instrument, the osteoporosis index of risk, the osteoporosis self-assessment tool for Asians, the simple calculated osteoporosis risk estimation, and the male osteoporosis risk estimation score. If you recall, we learned about the score in differential diagnosis, which is the simple calculated osteoporosis risk estimation, and it was developed to identify postmenopausal women likely to have low bone mineral density who may be selected for DEXA testing. This instrument uses a case selective approach to screen for osteoporosis by summing a score based on age, race, rheumatoid arthritis, history of non-traumatic fracture over 45 years of age, estrogen use, and weight. Bone, a bone density test is not indicated if the score is uh, less than or equal to five. And we also learned about the MORS, which is the male osteoporosis risk estimation score, and it calculates age, weight, and COPD. And a bone density test is not indicated if the score is less than or equal to five. The National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends a bone density test for women age 65 or older, women of menopausal age with risk factors, postmenopausal women under age 65 with risk factors, men age 70 or older, men age 50 to 69 with risk factors, and men or women that break a bone after age 50. Additionally, it's highly recommended for patients who currently smoke or used to smoke. This testing measures bone density at various sites of the body. This painless test can detect osteoporosis before a fracture occurs and can predict one's chances of fracturing in the future. If your patients currently smoke or used to smoke, you as their PT may want to advocate for them to ask their healthcare provider whether they are a candidate for a bone mineral density test, which can help determine whether medication should be considered. A bone density test is the only test that can diagnose osteoporosis before a broken bone occurs. This test helps to estimate the density of your bones and your chance of breaking a bone. The National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends a bone density test of the hip and spine by a central DEXA machine to diagnose osteoporosis. Dual energy x-ray absorptiometry scans of central skeletal sites such as the hip and spine are the gold standard assessment method to diagnose low bone mineral density. Nevertheless, central DEXA is limited by its high cost, lack of portability, and exposure to ionizing radiation for screening fracture and or osteoporosis risk in community dwelling older people, particularly those living in suburban and rural areas. The central DEXA is the most commonly studied and used bone measurement test to screen for osteoporosis and uses radiation to measure bone mineral density at the hip and lumbar spine. Screening tests can help identify people who are most likely to benefit from further bone density testing. They are also useful when a central DEXA is not available. They cannot accurately, accurately diagnose osteoporosis and they should not be used to see how well an osteoporosis medicine is working. The peripheral DEXA uses radiation to measure bone mineral density at peripheral sites such as the lower forearm and heel. Quantitative ultrasonography uses ultrasound to evaluate peripheral bone sites, and the most common site is the calcaneus. With most types of bone density tests, a person remains fully dressed, but you do need to make sure no buttons or zippers are in the way of the area to be scanned. The test usually takes less than 15 minutes. Bone density tests are non-invasive and painless. This means that no needles or instruments are placed through the skin or body. A central DEXA uses very little radiation as well. Your bone density test results are reported using T-scores. A T-score shows how much your bone density is higher or lower than the bone density of a healthy 30-year-old adult. A healthcare provider looks at the lowest T-score to diagnose osteoporosis. According to the World Health Organization, a T-score of negative one or above is normal bone density. A T-score between negative one and negative 2.5 means you have low bone density or osteopenia. 
a T-score of negative 2.5 or below is a diagnosis of osteoporosis. So, the lower a person's T-score, the lower the bone density. Medications fall into assessment of risk for development of osteoporosis for our patients. Here you see an extensive but not an exhaustive list of medications associated with potential bone loss. These include aluminum containing antacids, some anti-seizure medicines, cancer chemotherapeutic drugs, heparin, which is an anticoagulant, lithium, which is usually prescribed for bipolar disorder and mood stabilization, methotrexate, which is a chemotherapeutic drug and immunosuppressant, proton pump inhibitors, SSRIs, and some thyroid hormones in excess. One that is highlighted that is commonly associated with the development of osteoporosis are steroids, glucocorticoids, such as cortisone and prednisone. Taking steroid medicines as pills in a dose of five milligrams or more for three or more months can increase the chance of your patients developing osteoporosis and increasing their chance of bone loss. While taking steroids, it is especially important to get enough calcium and vitamin D, stop smoking, and exercise. These three topics will be discussed in more detail in the following slides. For calcium, men and women between 18 and 50 need 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. This increases to 1,200 milligrams when women turn 50 and men turn 70. Good sources of calcium include low-fat dairy products, dark green leafy vegetables, canned salmon or sardines with bones, soy products such as tofu, and calcium fortified cereals and orange juice. Older adults should be careful of consuming too much calcium, however, more than 2,000 milligrams a day, due to its potential increase in kidney stones and development of heart disease. When your body doesn't have enough calcium, it will start to break down your bones to get what it needs. That means you lose bone mass. So it's important to make sure that you and your patients have this nutrient every day in your diet or from supplements. For vitamin D, recommendations for vitamin D intake for men and women are between 600 or between, excuse me, between ages 51 and 70 is 600 IU daily. This increases to 800 IU after the age of 80. Older adults can get some vitamin D from sunlight, but this might not be a good source for them if they live in a high latitude, if they're housebound, or if they regularly use sunscreen to avoid the sun in hopes to decrease their risk of skin cancer. Up to 4,000 IU daily is safe for most people. Cigarette smoking was first identified as a risk factor for osteoporosis decades ago. Studies have shown a direct relationship between tobacco use and decreased bone density. Analyzing the impact of cigarette smoking on bone health is complicated. It is hard to, de to determine whether a decrease in bone density is due to smoking itself or to other risk factors common among people who smoke. For example, in many cases, people who smoke are thinner than non-smokers, tend to drink more alcohol, may be less physically active, and have poor diets. Women who smoke also tend to have an earlier menopause than non-smokers. These factors place many people who smoke at an increased risk for osteoporosis apart from their tobacco use. In addition, studies on the effects of smoking suggest that smoking increases the risk of having a fracture. As well, smoking has been shown to have a negative impact on bone, bone healing after a fracture. But why exactly does smoking cause osteoporosis? Cigarette smoke generates huge amounts of free radicals, which are molecules that attack and overwhelm the body's natural defenses. The result is a chain reaction of damage throughout the body, including cells, organs, and hormones involved in keeping bones healthy. The toxins upset the balance of hormones, like estrogen, that bones need to stay strong. 
Your liver produces more estrogen-destroying enzymes, which also leads to bone loss. Smoking triggers other bone-damaging changes, such as increased levels of the hormone cortisol, which leads to bone breakdown. Smoking also damages blood vessels, so there is poor blood supply of oxygen, which leads to decreased healing properties after fractures. Because smoking damages blood vessels, it also damages nerves in toes and feet, which can lead to more falls and fractures. So what are some physical therapy interventions for osteoporotic patients? The exercise component for bone building or slowing bone loss is very specific and similar for all ages. Bone grows when it is sufficiently and properly stressed, just as muscle grows when challenged by more than usual weight. It is best for a physical therapist to provide an individual bone building prescription to ensure that you are neither over exercising or under exercising. Typically, exercises are performed two to three times a week as part of an overall fitness program. PTs work with patients to build bone or lessen the amount of bone loss at areas most vulnerable to fracture through exercise, such as the hip, spine, shoulder, and arms. PTs can also help improve your, improve your dynamic balance to avoid falls with activities such as Tai Chi, Otago, Yoga, Bar, and Pilates. PTs can also help improve your posture with strengthening and bracing if needed. They can also adjust your work and living environments to limit risk. In other words, they can perform ergonomic adjustments. They can provide strengthening exercises that can be done with resistance bands or with body weight. And they can also provide weight-bearing exercises such as dancing, walking, light jogging, or stair climbing, which are all encouraged. The following exercises are not recommended for patients with osteoporosis. These are dangerous due to compressive loads placed on the spine and will increase the risk of compression fractures of the vertebrae. Many have to do with the placement of the spine while in position on the gym equipment. Sitting in a slouch posture places the highest load on the spine as we've learned in our musculoskeletal courses. So think about the position you're in as I'm listing these off. Crunches partial or full, chest fly, chest press, knee extensions on the knee extension machine, lat pull downs, especially ones behind the head, seated rows, standing toe touches with rotation, such as windmills, that's how I learned them as windmills, hamstring stretches in long sitting, back stretches like the one pictured to the right, and cardiovascular exercises that encourage flexion, such as cycling. We also did some research and found that water and endurance exercises have been shown to negatively affect bone density, and this means long distance endurance exercises. PTs can encourage strengthening of the transversus abdominis, cardio equipment such as the elliptical or treadmill, and incorporating more free weights to work on the target muscles as well as supporting musculature. When done with good posture, free weights will allow your deep spinal muscles to kick in and help you build stronger bones in your spine. Patients also have to be careful with golfing and racket sports due to the high amounts of twisting involved, as well as skiing or snowboarding due to the high risk of falling. Moving on to pharmaceutical interventions, which we as PTs obviously would not be involved in, but your patients might be on some of these medications. Bisphosphonates are typically tried first. These will slow down the bone resorption work of osteoclasts. These include Fosamax, which is a weekly pill, Actinel, which is a weekly or monthly pill, Boniva, which is a monthly pill or a quarterly IV infusion, and reclast, which is an annual IV infusion. There are also bone building drugs, which are prescribed for those with, with extremely low bone density or whose osteoporosis is caused by steroid medication, as we discussed previously. These include Forteo, which is a daily injection, Timelos, which is a daily injection, and Evenity, which is a monthly injection. 
The main side effects of bisphosphonate pills are stomach upset and heartburn. Patients should not lie down or bend over for 30 to 60 minutes after taking them due to the medicine coming back up into the esophagus. In patients who cannot take bisphosphonates due to reduced kidney function, denosumab, or prolia as it might more commonly be known, might be prescribed, and these are shallow injections every six months. Recent research indicates that there could be a higher risk of spinal fractures after stopping denosumab, so it's important that patients take it consistently. This slide includes a list of other general steps for preventing bone loss. The first one is avoiding substance abuse, such as limiting your alcohol intake and quitting smoking. According to WebMD, having more than two drinks per day is linked to higher chances of bone loss. It also states that smoking doubles the chance of bone loss and fractures by keeping the hormone estrogen in your body from working well. The second is avoiding the female athlete triad. Women who exercise and train intensely can have three issues, thin bones, lack of a menstrual cycle, and eating disorders. It often happens to young women who stick to very restrictive diets even though they work out a lot. Athletes who have problems with their periods have lower estrogen levels. And this often leads to lower bone mass. The third is reducing soda intake. Some findings show that colas, more than other carbonated soft drinks, lead to bone loss. It may be that extra phosphorus in them keeps your body from absorbing calcium, or it may just be that women are replacing calcium-rich drinks such as milk with soda. Uh, the fourth is eating a well-balanced diet, especially increasing protein intake. Protein is in every cell in your body, including your bones. Studies have shown that eating protein increases bone mineral density. The recommended daily protein intake is 0.4 grams per pound of body weight. And then lastly, maintaining a healthy weight. Here in this video, you'll see a summary of osteoporosis from Dr. Oz when he appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show to discuss this topic. Let's really look at osteoporosis. No, let's get dirty here. Let's get dirty. So let's just take a bone that we often look at. Uh, this is what the spine looks like. Wow. And, and that's actually what a ridge uh, that uh, is in the meniscus of the spine. And in the middle, of course, is the pulp. Now, let me just take the spine and cut it in half and show you two people yeah. who have spines that are very different. This is a spine that I've cut in the field at. Okay? Oh, please. I'm just taking it easy. <laughs> you can squeeze it, right? Wow, it's like a rib. Like a rib. Yeah. Now, you're eating, yeah, rib. that's a normal <laughs> spine. Like a normal rib. Yeah. But you'd expect to see. Well, that's a spine. In a restaurant. From a person. From a person. Okay. Now this Ooh, no. is the osteoporotic bone. Oh. Now I want you to take this. I want everyone to see this. I want you to take it and I want you to break it. To break this? Break it. Okay. Whoa. Didn't take much. Wow. Doesn't take much. This is what happens in osteoporosis. When we talk about getting frail, oh. these little bone pieces here that make up the spinal column will collapse, giving you a hump, the dowager's hump. Yeah. That's why people get shorter and shorter and shorter as they move, and then they can't get the kind of fullness in life, and that's why you don't want to look like that. But it doesn't have to be, because this bone is from someone who's older than this one was from. Really? And you have that control if you take action. All right. What was the results of our audience, first of all? Well, 74% of you are normal. But 26% of you have osteopenia. Nobody, thankfully, had osteoporosis. So you're all doing a reasonable job. But the osteopenia, especially because a lot of you are young, is going to translate to osteoporosis as you get older. So what do you do about it? Step number one, you got to lift weights. It's critically important. If you look at the societies that live the longest on the planet. Yes. Right? And there are three of them. right? Okinawa, Sardinia, and Costa Rica. Three longest lived societies. They have different foods, mm -hmm. different cultures. They behave differently towards each other, but they share one common characteristic. Every day they get up, they go up to the top of the mountain, they grab the bucket, fill it with water, and they cart it back down again, right? Every single day. It's not a workout, it's life. By keeping your bones strong, by lifting weights, you get there. Number two, 
you get over it. Too much alcohol and too much cigarettes, especially when you're young, because the process starts when you're 20 years of age. Mm -hmm. And the last thing, and this is a problem that we have all over America. And by the way, it's my favorite, favorite vitamin is vitamin D. 87% of people who live in Chicago who are older have vitamin D deficiency. We think it may be responsible for a lot of the cancers in this country. If you have multiple sclerosis, you ought to be taking vitamin D. A lot of the things that we link up to how much sun touches our body yeah. result from the fact we don't have enough vitamin D. And so getting in the vitamin my, D3... I think my whole staff is vitamin D deficient yeah. because we don't get out. You don't get out. No, really, literally. No. We don't it's get true. out. We don't get out. If yeah. you live north of Atlanta, you really need to be cautious about your vitamin D level. And no. if you're not sure, take it. Now, just a little bit of math here. If you sit in the sun for 15 minutes, which is what most folks ought to do, direct sunlight for 15 minutes, you'll make 10,000 units of vitamin D. D3, the good kind, the one you really want. You can't get anything close to that unless you take supplements. And for a lot of Americans, since they can't get into the sun as much as they need, they need to take vitamin D3. And as I mentioned, it's a dramatic impact on so many different walks of life, including autoimmune diseases. Okay, so this brings up the question of what vitamin should we be taking? For me, vitamin D3, because I'm in Chicago and I don't get out much. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. then you want to avoid all the things that go along with it. So the A, B, C, D, E's of vitamins. A, B, C, D, E's. Okay, so vitamin A, yeah. vitamin C, and vitamin E are the antioxidant vitamins. Okay. These are the ones that are critically important to keeping our membranes healthy. Now, so think ACE. ACE, good. Okay, good. A, C, E, okay. ACE. Now, the, the brains of a cell are not where the genes are. Right? It's not the nucleus. The brains of the cell is the membrane. The cell membrane lets us talk to each other. Okay. I can see you there, and I can see that I don't want to be with you, or I want to be close to you. Okay. If we don't have the right amount of antioxidants, we don't have the right kind of fats in our diet, then we don't actually allow that membrane to maintain its healthy structure. Bottom line, A, C, and E. Yes. Okay. There are two other vitamins you got to worry about. D, I covered. D. My favorite. Okay. And the last one is B. Right? So A, B, C, D, E, all of them. B vitamin is the metabolic boosting vitamin. It's the vitamin that's present in so many leafy green vegetables, all the foods that are precious to us. Most of us don't get anything close to what we need, in part because our food supply has changed and we're not eating what we could eat. So taking vitamin B as a supplement makes sense. So A, B, C, D, E. Take it any way you wish, but you need to get those five vitamins. This next video is from Osteoporosis Canada. It discusses some families that have been diagnosed, either both or one of the family members has osteoporosis, and they will discuss the impacts that it's had on their lives. My name is Joanne Legro Kelly. My name is Colin, Colin Kelly. I was diagnosed with osteoporosis about 12 years ago. Shortly after uh, my diagnosis, my husband Colin was diagnosed as well. I got into the sport of triathlon about 20 years ago. I had a running injury, it's one for a routine x-ray, and the uh, technician said, that looks a little light, I recommend that you get a bone density test done, and to my great surprise, came up with a diagnosis of osteoporosis. So I'm Amber and I'm 35 years old. The type of osteoporosis I have is pregnancy related. I had suffered from severe spinal fractures two months after giving birth to my son. I'm Jerry Corcoran. I'm 63 years old. I was diagnosed with osteoporosis when I was 55 years old. I'm Juanita Gledhill. I'm 53 years old, and I was diagnosed with osteoporosis just after my 50th birthday. I was surprised to get the diagnosis, even though I am a health professional and I considered myself a very healthy individual who eats well and is very active and exercises a lot. I thought that my active lifestyle would insulate me from such things. My doctor was proactive. He told me if there's a history of fracture in the family, my mother had osteoporosis. It's a good idea to go for a bone mineral density test. I I don't believe I had heard about osteoporosis when I was growing up. I always thought that was a disease for older women. There really wasn't any bone health that I was aware of younger. Quite honestly, had more to do with my teeth. 
than it did my actual bones. There's a lot of awareness about other conditions, other diseases, like heart attack, stroke, cancer, diabetes, but not about osteoporosis. When uh, Colm was diagnosed, of course I was concerned. I think probably the most difficult part for my wife was being called to emergency when I would have these um, uh, falls and breaks and was not sure what kind of condition her husband was in. I had significant pain in my back and I could hardly move. I was then in bed for two days. But it was really strange because there wasn't a specific incident. I didn't fall, I didn't lift something and suddenly, you know, hear a crack or anything like that. It just sort of came on throughout the course of one afternoon. When I got the call, I I actually couldn't believe it. I, I, I was taken aback. I started to think, so what does this what does this mean? And my first thoughts were, if I fall, I might break. I really couldn't do anything for my son other than nurse him. So if someone placed him in my arms, I could nurse him. But beyond that, I wasn't able, you know, to lift him or bathe him or really do any of those things that, you know, a mom should be doing. I don't think the public is all that aware about osteoporosis, especially men. When I was growing up, there was no thought, no discussion of bone health. Uh, it, it simply wasn't on the horizon. No one in my family had ever suffered, you know, from the disease. So it really wasn't, you know, well known to me uh, and certainly had no idea that it could affect younger people. I certainly wish that I had the awareness of what it was so that I could be sure to count the calcium and, uh, and, the, and even knowing that vitamin D was an, had an important role in uh, osteoporosis. I think knowing about my mom's osteoporosis, I really believe that my osteoporosis would have been more advanced when I was first diagnosed if I hadn't been aware of osteoporosis before. I decided I would like to do some volunteer work, so I thought that Osteoporosis Canada would be a good fit. As a 1-800 volunteer, I answer phone calls. I find that many of the callers want some information fast because they've been diagnosed with osteoporosis and they want to know where they go next. I explain my situation, my experiences, and that puts a lot of people at ease. They're pleased that I can speak to them on the same level as a, a patient. I think osteoporosis is really misunderstood. There's lots of misconceptions. I think Osteoporosis Canada does a great job of getting information out about the disease and about how we can help prevent it and help live well with it. So it ended up that I lost almost three inches of my height, all, you know, all in my torso because of all of these fractures. Really wasn't able to have, you know, the year off that I had envisioned. And it took a really, really long time for me to recover from that and not be in, you know, significant pain. I don't let osteoporosis overshadow my life, but I let it inform my choices. So for myself and my family, I think osteoporosis has changed our plans. I mean, we wanted to have a couple of children, and I don't think that will be in the cards for us anymore. You know, it's your bones, it's your skeleton, it's, it's your structure. So really, it is everything. I'm thankful that I learned about osteoporosis. I learned that I had it, and that I learned that I could deal with it. I could live with it. Canadians need to know that osteoporosis can happen to anyone. Once you've been diagnosed, you're living with it. Bones need care. And there's a disease that can actually compromise your bones because I don't think people understand that. That's all my son has ever known. I feel like he hasn't really been affected by my condition or by my inability to lift him up. The other day, you know, he didn't want to do something. So he said, oh, I can't, my back hurts. And I thought, oh my gosh, does he, <laughs> does he hear me saying that? I'm grateful that I know that I have the disease because now I can actually do something about it and I can impact how much it impacts my life. I am the face of osteoporosis. 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 I am the face of osteoporosis.
So just a take home message for everyone based on what we've discussed in this lecture. PTs can educate families and youth groups on proper exercise and posture and about the need to move daily to build bone strength and prevent bone loss. We did not specifically discuss pediatrics in this presentation, but children with health issues such as spina bifida, diabetes, Crohn's disease, and cerebral palsy are at a greater risk for bone disease and can particularly benefit from PT. Proper physical conditioning is crucial for children and adolescents since the majority of bone is built during adolescence and peaks by the third decade of life. PTs serve in an absolutely critical role for risk assessment and treatment of osteoporosis. This should begin with numerous primary prevention practices throughout the lifespan. We hope you enjoyed and learned something from our presentation. Head to the discussion board to share what information you would like to apply to your clinical practice and participate in our interactive activity. Here is our list of references. Thank you all for listening.